And so they're now get, well, let's put it over here, they get that strip of land. So they're doing their necessary labor in ancient, plus their surplus labor in ancient. So that's the total amount of labor they now perform. And they now can set in motion all of their labor. Why? Because the surplus labor in feudalism has become zero. They don't have to work at the lowest land. Remember, that was three days. They now can spend three plus three on their own land, six days, and they get the benefit of this three days of labor. They don't have to give this to the Lord anymore because it's a ball. Lord, you know, the Lord is, the feudal Lord has been abolished. It's zero. And hence, the yield of their surplus goes to them. But the problem was, the problem was the strip of land was so small, it was very difficult to have surplus. Very, very difficult. So, in effect, this, this was almost, it, it wasn't much left over after they did their, their uh, necessary labor. It, it wasn't enough to get a big surplus. They tried, they put in the six days of labor, but it didn't yield much food. And then after what was left, when they consumed, there wasn't much left over as a surplus. It was squeezed. Because they didn't have sufficient land. They didn't have access to animals and technology, and so forth. They were very poor, and hence their surplus was constrained. It, just, it didn't yield anything. Okay? Because much of the labor that they, they put into this, much of the total labor, times its productivity, that just about covered their consumption. So they put in the total labor, the six days, times its productivity, it just about covered their consumption, and there wasn't much left for profits. This was really sweet for most of them. So if this were 100, this was 95, this was 5. Because they didn't have enough land. And they didn't put the access to tools and so forth, etc. So the former serfs then had the following problems. Out of their profits, which was really squeezed, they now have to pay. Oh, listen. Plus rents. That's what this is. So the payment of a rent by the ancient is what the, their former lord gets. Plus. The tax that the Tsar was still le levying on these people, the tax by the Tsar, that didn't go away. Plus, the redemption fee. You had to pay for your freedom, the redemption fee. Redemption fee. Look at the equation. If this is small, if this stuff is large, and this is getting squeezed, and it was next to impossible for those ancients to buy enough, an animal, means of production, fertilizer, whatever, to develop his, or more land to develop his or her farm. So for the masses of the ancients, the small surplus, because they just didn't have sufficient land, and these rents, the taxes to the Tsar, and the redemption fee made it next to impossible for them to survive. So they were continually dipping into their consumption, sometimes to pay the Tsar's taxes, to pay the redemption fee, and so the threat of starvation continued after the 1860s, right up until 1917. And there was an enormous amount of discontent in agriculture, whilst at the same time, the Lord is doing quite well. The former Lords are doing quite well. So you have a polarized class structure in agriculture where most of the people live. A mass of very poor regions and a smaller group of former Lords now becoming important capitalists who really were doing quite well. Much better off than they had ever from the feudalism. So, despite the feudal lords no longer having feudalism, and despite 
their political and cultural domination being eroded, the, to, you know, what it was under this absolute state under feudalism. The same people who were the laws, now their income and wealth is expanding under this land reform. And they're becoming an important group of capitalist farmers employing these desperate ancients. So the ancients, many of them now, kind of split up into two personalities. What I'm describing to you is across the third world today. It actually occurred in the United States too, in our own history. So you have individuals who they get a they get a necessary labor from their farm and surplus labor as best they can from their farm. It's not very much as best they can. But this is so small that they have to sell their labor power to that capitalist form of lord. And so they can get a V in capitalism. So they take on kind of two personalities, same person, two personalities, this farm. They have one foot in agriculture, all onto their farm, and it has a thousand years of history, whether it be in Russia or whether it be the Philippines. But they continue, they also, in order to make ends meet to expand their income, they also are forced to sell their labor power to the capitalists to supplement their squeezed income as ancient farms. And as I mentioned to you, another group arises in agriculture. Besides these desperate ancients who are also sellers of labor power, another group arises, and they arise mainly from the ancients themselves. These are individuals, for whatever complicated reasons, they're able to hire some of these destitute ancients, and they're called kulaks. Richard Thomas. This is the Russian word for kulaks. Okay. And they are hiring these people and they get the surplus. But they also may do ancient labor in their farms as well. They work along with their workers. So these people also put in ancient labor as well as they hire the labor power of these other people. They're famous. And so within agriculture, you have a differentiation of the peasantry, it's called, by historians. Some of the peasants, these ancient peasants, they remain terribly poor with these two jobs. Others start to do much better. And they become small capitalists in the rural areas, along with the big capitalists. Got, okay, so far, get this image of what's going on here. This polarization in the society between these petty, I'm sorry, petty producers, these agents and the large capitalists, the impoverization of the agents in terms of being squeezed, rents, the czar, redemption fee, being forced to sell their labor power, working these two jobs, and so forth, etc. Rising up in agriculture of still another small capitalist class that go along with a large one and so forth. In the 1880s, in the 1880s, a disaster hits agriculture in Russia. In the 1880s, the price of grain, that most important crop, drops. But the Tsar doesn't stop his taxes. In fact, he increases them. The land, the lords of, the, of these means of production, they don't stop their rents, they even ask for more rents. And the, the redemption fee continues. While the demands increase, the ancients are desperate because they, they're selling their food for a lower and lower price. While their taxes in money form the rents in money form and the redemption fee in money form is rising. Put yourself in their shoes. 
The demands on you for taxes, rents, redemption fees are continuing, if not rising, whilst at the same time you can only sell your goods for lower prices. You're being squeezed on the input side, the cost side, and on the output side at one and the same time. Now, why did the price of grain fall? The price of grain falls because of nothing that occurs in Russia. It's something that occurs in the United States and Canada. So in the U.S., let me tell you very briefly this story. It's important even for today. The Civil War is over in the United States, so agriculture resumes in the Midwest, as it did before. The soldiers come home to their farms, you know, Iowa and Wisconsin and Minnesota and so forth. They're all returning. They're returning to farming. Railroads are com completed, both going west and going east. The railroads from the east connect the Midwest to the great ports of the east, New York City, Philadelphia, Boston, and so forth. All the world. Then, a new uh, retailer arrives upon the scene, located in Chicago, called Sears Roebuck. And Sears Roebuck invents something new, called the catalog. Probably, probably went out loud around this time. And in the catalog, it grows to about a thousand pages, in the catalog are a host of new kinds of consumer goods produced in Chicago, but mostly along the east coast of the great manufacturing cities of New York, and Buffalo, and so forth, etc. And the catalog appears in all the country stores of the Midwest, the farmers and the farmers' wives, the male people, they go to the, look at the catalog and they see a plethora, they see a vast array of different goods that they can buy. No longer do the women produce their own clothes, they can buy cheap clothes from Sears Rose. The Sears Rose, they can order via that catalog. They can buy new farm equipment, with the little pictures of all this stuff, so they can see what they can buy, they can order every time, an incentive for them. You couple that with the end of the war, the soldiers returning, new kinds of technology and means of production which they can buy from Sears in these catalogs, plentiful credit, to make a long story short, the agriculture takes off. Good way to describe it. And the supply of grain in the United States and in Canada shifts to the right in economic terms. <coughs> Don't forget now, the soil is very fertile. Those glaciers, those glaciers came all the way down from Canada into the United States, produced very fertile soil that goes down 15, 20 inches in the Midwest, deep black earth, and you can grow grains, and now there's an incentive to take advantage of that deep earth, and the farmers do that, and so they, pretend, they plant more and more grains, in economic terms, the supply shifts to the right, the grain is put upon railroads, the war is over, you can do all this. Okay, you, don't have to, you don't have to worry about military goods and invasions by the seven armies. So it's peacetime, they put the grains, they ship the grains to Philly, to Boston, to New York City, to Baltimore. They put on big ships, the ships sail across the ocean, and they sell the grains to Europe, including Russia. Guess what happens? The price of grain falls in Russia. The grain farmers in Russia, they're on the blackboard. These ancients, okay, as well as the capitalist farmers, but the ancients who are having a desperate time because of what I described to you, now can sell their grain for a lower and lower price. Now, the ancient farmers, unlike you, never studied economics. They didn't know from supply and demand. They just didn't know. I mean, I don't know from quantum mechanics either. I never studied it. I don't know. So they didn't know supply and demand. But they knew they had a calamity on their hands. They knew this was a disaster because the price of grain fell. So in the theorization which they used, they blamed this on the devil. Right? Because God does good things and the devil does bad things. <coughs> so across Russia, they blamed the fall in the price of grain on the devil. And it turned out, in the organization, the devil had agents on earth 
who did the devil's work. And the agents were called Jews. And so the peasants, the agents, did it perfectly logical what they would do. They killed the agents, agents of the devil. So across Russia, they began to murder and hang the devil's agents, which didn't stop the price of grain from falling. But then that never persuades me. They're called, in Russian, it's called, the word is called pogrom, P-O-G-R-O-M. It's very famous. Of course, it's an embarrassment for that the history of Russia, but nonetheless, it's, it's pogroms. And the way to deal with this is to kill the people, and it doesn't do with that. You understand the power theory, whether it be in the 1880s or today. You understand the power theory. Let's see now. There's a deficit in Wisconsin. Oh, I know. The cause of the deficit in Wisconsin were the workers in Wisconsin. That's like for the Jews. It has nothing to do with that. It's got to do with the business side. That's why there's a deficit. You got the wrong agent, whether it be Wisconsin or in Moscow. The power of the theory. So, the agents are beside themselves. They get a disaster on their hands. They are angry. They are upset, they actually engage in murder. If you ever want to know how upset they are, that's what they're forced into. So let me start off. Across then the late 19th century, in agriculture, we have to know, as I go along in industry, we have to follow. We have the former feudal estates converted to large capitalist farms. So well, capitalism is growing in Russia. Yes, it's a sea of feudalism. But it's also a new class structure is emerging and growing, which is capitalism here, and by the Kulaks, capitalism here. In agriculture. We have new industries emerging in Russia, in the cities, who are hiring these destitute agents. So increasingly, the agents, they can't find jobs here, or with the Kulaks, so they leave their farm and they go into the city to look for work so they can find a source of income to maintain their, just their family farm and pay these rents, the taxes, uh, and the redemption fee. So they can increasingly sell their labor power in the cities. So what you have in economic terms is the supply of labor power in the cities continually shifts to the right. We're talking about millions of individuals who begin to emigrate into the cities of Russia seeking jobs. And so many of them, the, the price of labor power, the wage, the value, is being pushed down. The cheap labor power, because of the agricultural situation, encourages what? Industrial growth. Because the surplus now is so high. Right? If you get a cheap V, you've got a big SV. In fact, it's so high that foreign capitalists come in. They're attracted by the cheap labor power to produce manufacturers in Russia for the Russian market as well as for other markets. So it attracts foreign capital of two sorts, German capital and French. The Tsarist state begins to establish increasingly its own capitalist industry. That is, the Tsar begins to strengthen the alcohol. Remember, I told you the alcohol industry of the feudalism that's converted into capitalism? He's hiring these destitute agents, some of whom, some of whom were his own former serfs. <coughs> the metal industry is a state capitalist industry, rail industry, alcohol industry, metal industry. Here, the former serfs becomes wage laborers working for the the Tsar. So this is a, this is capitalism inside the state in which the one person, the Tsar, becomes the appropriator and distributor of the surplus, and it's growing rapidly. Finally, it's not just foreign capital that comes in, but also private capital inside Russia starts to grow. Also attracted by the cheap labor power. So the the, some of these lords here, former lords, who are agricultural capitalists, they begin to, they're making so much, they begin to now 
set up capitalist industries, capitalist enterprises in these cities attracted by this cheap labor problem. And the old merchants and money lenders, they too begin to expand their capitalist businesses in the urban areas. It's still mainly rural. But just, you know, still it's a sea of, of squeezed ancients, <laughs> kulaks, agricultural capitalists, but there's no question that industrial capitalism is growing very, very rapidly. In fact, it's the most rapidly growing capitalism of the day. It's the China India of the day. Okay, roughly from the 1880s to World War I. It's the fastest growing industrial capitalism around. But it's still small. No, it's not it's still small. Let me then turn, lastly, to, this, to the state itself, the czarist state. Because it's, it's important, because don't forget the Bolsheviks can overthrow the state. So let, I want to turn and examine the state and see if I can pick up the animosity to the state. Okay, okay so the state. So I want the, you know, like any state, I want the revenues and I want the expenditures. So this is the Tsarist state, which continues across this feudal, now ancient capitalist society. Former feudal, now ancient capitalist. Well, the Tsarist state gets this uh, redemption fee from the uh, ancients. So that's certainly one source of its income. And then it has to give you know, the expenditure here, that's the interest on the debt to the former lords. So, this is a tax. It taxes the ancients, and it gives the proceeds in the form of, you know, interest to these former to these the lords, former lords. Then it has a tax on the ancients, I just described that to you, that continues. Plus, it begins to tax these workers. The workers in agriculture and industry. That is, the capitalist workers. So it taxes the capitalist workers, both in agriculture and industry. It levies some taxes. And this keeps going. These would be the expenditures for these workers here in capitalism and for the ancients in agriculture. Okay? Yeah. What is the F stand for in R? I'm sorry. This is the expenditures. And in R F, what is the F stand for? So this is the redemption fee. All right. Okay. Then you have a tax. So this is the subsumed class revenue from the capitalism that's grown. So this is a tax on the capitalists which is growing rapidly. So this is a tax on farm capital and domestic capital. This is a tax on capitalism in agriculture, these large estates that become capitalists, and in industry, which is growing. So growth growing, especially this one, in industry that's growing rapidly. Attracted by cheap labor power. And this would be the expenditures here. Expenditures for capitalists, expenditures for workers. Then, of course, you have the surplus value in the state capitalist industries, like alcohol. So this is the Tsar's industries. State, the state capitalist. This is the, uh, <coughs> this is the surplus value in state capitalism. And this is the expenditures here. Ready? This is a wash. You tax them, you give the expenditures. You tax the agents, you give the expenditures to your formal lords. Because that gets these people very upset, the agents. They're not getting anything back, but nonetheless, they're getting the land. So 
you tax them, and you give the proceeds to the former lords. That's how you compensate the former lords. This is zero. This is enormous. This is zero. Let's look at the blackboard and, and this kind of matrix. What you got here? You're taxing the workers in industry and agriculture, and you're taxing the ancients, and you're giving back lousy roads, no education, poor public safety, very poor health facilities, not much in terms of public goods, but you're taxing. Here, the tax on the capitalist and the farm capitalist is zero, and you're giving them everything, as I'm going to explain in a moment. Do you think that might create animosity? Do you think that might create a problem? <coughs> what do you think? Besides you. What else? Who are you, sir? Pick somebody at random. Why? Why would it create a problem? Are being taxed without getting any benefits. Yeah, I can't do better than what you did. You're getting taxed and you're getting nothing in return. It's even worse because you're getting taxed, you're getting nothing, but that means that your taxes can be used to subsidize the people that are exploiting you. So in this society, you have growing resentment. Not only between the, this, this polarization in agriculture, but you have growing resentment against the Tsar for this absurdity that we have on the blackboard. Since so some of you have seen the movies and read the book, how is this going to end up? What's going to happen to the Tsar? <coughs> and the Tsar, you know, what's going to happen to the Tsar? Yeah? They're going to get killed. So you want to, you know, murder is an awful thing. So you want to sit down and you want to begin to understand a little bit why on earth would people be driven to such an awful and god-awful thing to do. That's what's on the blackboard. So you want to be, you want, we're beginning to try and understand what was driving these people, well in part, it's not just the animosities that are going on in the agricultural sector. The, the farmers being squeezed, as I told you, to the mass of the population on the input of the output side of what's going on, but also it's what's happening in the state. Yes, sir? Those subsidies that go out the capitalists, do those go to the foreign companies? I know that they're just patient, patient, patient. We'll do it. Let's get this, this gross. This was taking off, and of course, this was taking off. So, the state capitalist industry was growing very rapidly, and the expenditures for state capitalism, we've done that in this course already, was just taking off. Capital accumulation was growing very rapidly. That very rapidly growing state industry. The problem was that the Bottom equation was growing more rapidly than the revenues, in part because you weren't taxing the capitalists, whether it be in agriculture or industry. They were, these people were so poor that you couldn't generate sufficient revenues to finance the anomalies of the growth of state capitalism and the subsidies and so forth, etc., that we were giving to the private capitalists. So what did the Russian state do to solve this problem on the blackboard of a deficit? Because the E was growing more rapidly than was the revenues. What 
was six two. Yep. No. Nope. Let me do it again. The taxes were zero, and these people were so poor you couldn't tax them anymore. So what did the state do? The food again. You're not going to tax the capitalists. So the taxes were zero, and these people were too poor. So what did the state do? Let me do it again. The ta- Jesus Christ, yeah? What? Oh! You know, there's a purpose to this because it's the United States today. Yeah? So the state. Yes, sir? I was going to say they just let it fix itself. No. No, no. Don't do that. You've been pretty good the last several weeks, so don't do that. The state borrows money internationally. It issues debt. The Tsar issues bonds. The bonds are bought and sold in the great financial centers of Europe, Paris, London, and of course in New York City as well. So the bonds of the Tsar grow, and investors in these different places, and other places around the world, buy the debt. Because the expenditures exceed the revenues. <laughs> Could you do this for the United States today? Yes. Okay, good. That's all. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Good for you, man. is corporate tax revenues as a percentage of the gross national product in the United States from 1946 to 2007. You can get right off the list. That's what the corporations pay in taxes as a percentage of GNP. This is where it was in 46, this is where it is now. All of you, I think, are required to take courses in statistics or something like that, so you know done well. If you fit a trend to this, it's going down. Is the roughly is the percentage of military expenditures by the federal government as a percentage of GNP. It's also going down because the GNP is growing so rapidly in the denominator. What's interesting is the distance between the two. This is the revenues, these are the expenditures. States. This is in part why we have the deficit that we have. And the way to solve this is to cut taxes on corporations. <laughs> so we ask Ron Paul the next time. But he loves graphs. Love this one. So it's not just in this former Russia to become the Soviet Union, to become Russia again in the 1880s, but it's in our own country as well. That's 
the power theory. It disguises and illuminates. Whether it be here or over here. So you've got building animosity in the Soviet and the in Russia against the Tsarist state, against the landed capitalist class, and against these growing capitalists in the uh, urban area. Let me take, because I told you, okay, let, let, let me go back now to this industrialization. The Tsarist state started to spend more, it all did spend, but it started to spend more and more on military expenditures. So it, it wanted to now, it learned a lesson from the Polish invasion. It wanted to build a modern army as fast as it could, because it was scared it would be invaded again by the West. So the, the Russians, historically, right up to the present time, have always had this kind of defensive attitude to build a large, massive army to resist the invading armies. It worked out against uh, Hitler. So they, they, they continually invested an enormous amount in expenditures to build a big military machine as much as they could. Well, that means the state was buying commodities from private capitalists. We were asking that question before. So that's part of the expenditures for the capitalists that I have on the blackboard. That's rising in part because of the expenditure on military, and that gives a guaranteed contract to your private industrial capitalists. You see that? So if you are producing military goods today in the States, you have less of a problem than if you're producing cars because you get a contract from the federal government to buy your goods. You don't have to worry about the vagaries of the market. That's why they, they, those contracts are so important for General Electric. Well, in this case, in the 1880s then, the capitalists got this kind of contract from the state, number one, number two. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to buy inputs and to sell your outputs without transport systems. So the Tsarist state was spending more and more on infrastructure to build railroads across this vast society, to build road systems. Those are all kinds of expenditures for private industry, besides purchasing the commodities. Third, they gave subsidized credit to private industry, to encourage them. So the interest rate was negligible on the loans that the state itself gave to these companies. Sometimes they gave them outright rubles. Here, here's a bunch of money set up a, a machine gun industry. Set up a sewing machine industry. Set up a clothing industry. While all, all of that is going on, Okay. For the, so here's your private capitalists now in industry in the urban areas, which is, as I said, growing rapidly. So here's our equations. This is zero. You don't tax it. There's no corporate tax. So you don't tax it. Why? Well, because you're going to encourage to grow these other expenditures, you're going to encourage especially capital accumulation, plus everything else, or prime, that we, that we studied in this course. You're going to encourage this to industrialize the country, to build a, a powerful enough industrial power to resist foreign aggression, and also so that Russia can become a major capitalist industrial power and no longer entrapped by its feudal past. Then what have become? That would become like Germany and become like France and England and so forth. And one way to do that is to industrialize and employ those destitute serfs, I'm sorry, destitute nations, so they don't cost them a bit. Get them freaking jobs! My goodness gracious, there you go. Make the tax lower to 
increase this so we can offset the potential revolt in this country. At the same time, this is enormous. Why? Because the V is so low. No wonder you have to get the jobs. So the surplus in industry is enormous. Enormous surplus. The tax on the surplus is zero. That enables this to be higher than it would be otherwise. At the same time, you're giving subsidized credit, cheap transport, you're buying the commodities of the capitalists. Well, as you might guess, the profit rate in here takes off, both for domestic and foreign capital. So there's a tremendous inducement here, incentive, if you want, under this kind of uh, state auspices to grow state, grow private industry and state capitalist industry, and it takes off. So in this relatively underdeveloped country, the Sea of Angels, you have a growing capitalism in agriculture and the Kulars, but a rapidly growing industrial capitalism here, although well, it's so small, because of the profit rate being so high due to cheap labor and all kinds of stimulants given by the Tsar state to private capitalism. So, at this point in time, it's, it's, it's weird. The society has a relatively underdeveloped agricultural low productivity, but it also has some of the biggest factories in the world. So the sewing machine factories, enormous. The text, some of the textile mills are enormous, the biggest in the world. Whilst at the same time, you have a relatively, in quotes, backward agricultural sector. <laughs> Rapidly growing in industrial capitalism, private and state, from roughly the 1880s up until World War I. But here too, tensions start to rise. Why? Because the V is so low. And the V is so low because the real wage is so low. And the real wage is so low because of those destitute agents. And the agents are destitute because of the high redemption fee the high rents, and the high taxes by the side. This is a mess. In 19... Okay, things happen to add to this. You know, in your history classes, they would, they would uh, you know, make a big deal with this. We don't have time. So I just wanted to show you the contribution of the class structure to, 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 to the eventual collapse. But let me mention other things. While all of this is going on, a new movement arises in the cities. It's not just in Russia, it happens elsewhere, including in the United States. There are people who get together, highly motivated, they have a particular theorization of the world, that we have, I've done it in this course, but it's different from Marxism. It's called anarchism, and it grows rapidly. And these anarchists hate the state. They have a different kind of theory. Okay? They think the devil is the state. And so you, the way to get rid of the devil on the earth is to get rid of the state. And so what they, the way that they do that is they take bombs and throw them at the state. Unfortunately, the collateral damage is pretty bad. And so you have within the cities this anarchist movement and these terrorists at the time, the terrorists. It's not unique uh, to the of Russia. And one of the most important anarchists who ever lived, who was not a terrorist, was a gentle human being, he's a Russian. His name was Tolstoy. And he was a hero in Russia. Magnificent writer, never read anything this curve. Yes, sir. Uh, War and Peace. Read the uh, movie. The book is very, very thick. It's a very thick book. So, if it, with thick books like this, Especially the Russian novels, you only read the last page. 
Number one, number two. Okay, and again, not in order of importance. Number two. A, uh, a war breaks out between Japan and Russia. So the war that takes place in, is not in other courses. There's a new empire that's growing in the East, Japan. And it too was feudal. It overthrows its feudalism and it brings about a new kind of capitalism with every state inter intervention. It's growing rapidly, 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 and it takes on a weak system of, of, of what it understands to be a weak system of imperialism, which is threatening in Russia. And it defeats Russia. To make a long story short, it defeats Russia. So this is the Russo-Japanese War, and this is a major blow inside Russia. It's a cultural shock, because all this money that had been poured into building the armament industry, the weapons industry, and so forth, all of that turns out to be not successful. And Russia <coughs> is defeated by someone, they don't even know who they are, the Japanese, in 1905. Uh, 1905, no. Actually, I don't remember what it was. Turn this century, 1905. What was it? 1905. Third, World War I breaks out, 1914. And the Germans invade Russia. Now, the Tsarist state, it can't hold together this society with these kinds of contradictions present. It's being ripped apart internally by these angry and upset agents and the tensions that are building here, and the open unrest by the angry and upset workers who are being squeezed by these low real wages and are losing their farms, and by the cultural shock of losing a war to this new rising state, Japan, by these crazy anarchists who were throwing bombs, making it impossible to walk in the city, and now by a war in which the husband's and sons of the ancients and workers are being massacred by this rapidly developing German industrial machine. The rifles often that these soldiers, Russian soldiers, get don't work. They blow up in their hands. The machine guns blow up. And so the Germans, not just one, but the Germans march right through like your butt. And so you have, no matter where you look, disasters looming in this Russian society. The former feudal lords, they want the Tsar to maintain their rents, to maintain these redemption fees and keep agricultural wages low. The kulaks, the richer agents, they want the state to protect them from the angry ancients, their neighbors will want to kill them because they're so desperate and their wages are so low. The capitalists want the Tsar to grant them new laws, which will give them even more power, to maintain zero taxes on them, to subsidize them, and to keep industrial wages low. The workers want higher wages, real wages, so they can survive and they can consume because they're often on the verge of starvation. They, ancients want a no more redemption, redemption fee, lower taxes on them, and reduce rents. I mean, you're, you, you need a sophisticated state to hold this together, and it can't while it's waging and losing a war to the Germans. That's the big, big picture. Second part of it. Let's go back to the, what I told you a long time ago, but you can't remember everything, so I'm going to remind you. The Germans are kind of aware of this, not in Marxian terms, but they're aware of the mess of Russia. So they take a guy, his name was Lenin, remember this man? They put him on a train, they seal the train, and they send this agitator into this simmering pot here to see if it can blow up. And so they send Lenin back into Russia, and Lenin becomes a catalyst in mobilizing who? The workers in industry and the ancients in agriculture. Let me go against it's really important. 
He becomes a catalyst in mobilizing the ancients in agriculture, who were destitute and angry and upset, and the workers in industry. They're coming together to form an alliance to get rid of this impossibility that they're facing. They get rid of this thing. The alliance that he forms, he's successful in doing this, the alliance that he forms is called an alliance of uh, the hammer and the sickle. The image that's on the Russian flag, the hammer represents these destitute industrial workers. The sickle represents these destitute agents. Bringing together these two radically different class structures into one unified totality against the capitalist landlords against the gulags, against the industrial capitalists, and against the state, the Tsarist state. In fact, things are such a mess that some of the capitalists in agriculture and industry, some of them, and some of the bankers, and some of the merchants recognize this. They did. People are right. They should understand this thing is falling apart. So they say to the Tsar, they march to the Tsarist, he's still, you know, still, still around. They say to them, look, you have to, this is this book, reform the society to avoid a Bolshevik revolution. You've got to reform. You've got to get rid of that goddamn redemption fee. This is ridiculous. Lower those taxes, Mr. Tsar. Raise the workers' wages. Reform, reform, otherwise we're going to lose it. And they're led by a man who only died just a few years ago. New York City. His name was Kerensky. I can't spell it. <laughs> Kerensky. Probably a relative of mine. And so he leads the reform. This is Kerensky. He leads the reformers. Okay, to try to reform capitalism. But, to make a short story, it is really short, shorter. The regime collapses, the uh, Bolsheviks take over, they throw out the reformers, Kerensky, Lenin marches in. By the way, it's not very many people. The Bolsheviks maybe were talking, I don't know, a million people as most of them. So it's not a lot of people we're talking about. The revolutionaries seize the state, they, as you know, they kill the Tsar, okay, and they take over and they establish socialism. Okay, so it's the end of capitalism. So we have a Bolshevik revolution in 1917 that comes out of all these struggles. The first thing that Lenin does is, this is not surprising, no more war. What the Germans wanted out of him, he does, he says, to the soldiers in the uh, Western Front, come home. And not only come home, but we're going to give you more land than you ever had before. It's yours. So the state under Lenin seizes all that land that the agricultural capitalists had, takes it away, collected by associate the means of production, takes it away from them and gives the land to these returning soldiers and also to the ancients who were already who were not soldiers but remained in the Russian farm. So the soldiers say, What? No longer are we going to be killed. But we can go home and we can get land that we've been wanting for hundreds of years for free. They drop it, it's very famous. They drop their weapons, most of which didn't fire anyway. They drop their weapons, they turn around, and they march east a thousand miles. It's the end of World War I. Russia with frost. Okay. And these returning soldiers, like they're really happy. Because they got what they want, land, and they no longer are going to be killed. So they support the Bolsheviks. Number two. Don't mind that. The state gets rid of the redemption fee. Good God. The state makes those rents on means of production zero. Because it gets, it gets rid of this. All the laws, the agricultures. They get rid of them. The cows. And of course, as I said, it ends the war and it gives uh, the land to the soldiers. So the ancients are really happy. And the agricultural workers are really happy. They know it means a different world for them. All their demands on their surplus have been have gone to zero. The redemption fee, the rents, 
and the czar's taxes, and now they have more land for themselves, and they're no longer being sharp. Number one. Okay, so they said change. Number two. Is the Lenin, very, very smart man, and surrounded by also very bright Marxists, Trotsky, T R O T S K Y, Stalin. So there's the three biggies Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, and also other people, a guy by the name of Bukharin, I don't know. D U C A. What do they do? Um, they read the book I asked you to read. If you mandatory first exam, they read it like you read it. And the first thing they do is collectivize the means of production. Because that's what Lenin, that's I'm sorry, people said you should do. That's what Kowski's going to ask you to do. They collectivize the means of production. And they get rid of markets. They institute then they get rid of private property. They replace private with collective property. So if you're a citizen of Russia, you own the property. And they distribute goods and services not on the basis of markets, but on the basis of planning. They establish planners. So they allocate goods and services, both inputs and outputs, on the basis of planning. Just like Engels said, he was supposed to do. And these planners have tried to, they attempt to balance the supplies and demands of grains and labor power and means of production in all of these markets and manufacturing goods. Number one. Okay, so that's the second one. Third, they embrace and teach Marxian theory. And the students hate it. Let me do it again. Jokes lost. <laughs> they embrace and they teach Marxian theory. They don't teach what well, Keynesian theory hasn't been invented. They don't teach neoclassical theory. They don't do it. That's a capitalist theory for them. So what they do is make all the students read capital. And they teach it in the universities and high schools as well. So Marxian theory becomes the theorization which is deployed in that society. And they come to believe the following story that I'm giving you. And I'm going to repeat the story. Okay? So you can put it in context now of this Russian Revolution. The story is that the workers, in combination with the ancients, they capture the state, they get rid of, they produce a new state, a dictatorship of the proletariat. But let me add that dictatorship of the ancients and the proletariat. Hammer and sickle. And they change the relations of production by radically replacing private with collective ownership, by replacing private markets with socialized markets. That will get rid of the barrier to the forces of production, which will unleash the forces of the technology and so forth, which will enable wealth in Russia to grow. And eventually that wealth can be distributed to the basis, to the population on the basis of need rather than labor perform, and at that point the state will wither away. That's what they did. That was again, that was the, that was their, their theorization, the mantra, that's what they taught in the schools again and again and again. That was the new culture that was produced. So Okay, so that we got the Bolshevik Revolution, we got these, these uh, Bolsheviks, these, that's what they were called, these uh, uh, young socialist communists in power. Are you ready now? Here's what happened. So the revolution in 1917, so with the next two years, 1919, a war breaks out. It's called war communism. So between uh, roughly 1919, 1921, there's a Actually, 1918, 1919, 1921, there is a terrible civil war in Russia. And the civil war is as follows. Those capitalist landlords, those kulaks, and those 
capitalist in industry, and some of the supporters of the Tsar, they didn't all disappear. Yes, it's true, some of them ran away to Paris and to New York City, two places people would wisely run away to. It's true, but also some of them stayed behind, and some of them even came back from Paris and New York. To make a long story short, they organized an army. And it was called the White Army. White being the color of truth, the color of God. And that White Army was supported by British troops, French troops, and a few Americans as well. So the Americans, the British, and the French, and the Germans, sorry, the Germans, they landed soldiers in the eastern part of Russia, and along with this army of former kulaks, former uh, uh, capitalists, and so forth, etc., they amassed an army supported by the West, and they took on uh, a red army, white versus red. There was a great movie that was made several years ago, Reds, I think it was called, on this. And you got a civil war, a vicious civil war emerging, in which the whites went on the attack against the Bolsheviks, the Reds, to defeat them. And the general leading the Reds was this guy, Trotsky. So the professor became a general. It turned out he was a very effective general. Luck. And they fought a major civil war. And it's called War Communism. That's the label given to the fighter. And it lasted for roughly three years. Number two, in the turmoil of the Bolshevik Revolution, when the Bolsheviks were struggling and the, and the soldiers coming back from the war, blah, 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 something extraordinary happened inside the industries within, the so uh, within Russia, which was the following. The workers seized the factories. The workers, in this, you know, with the turmoil of the day, with the collapsing of the Tsar, the soldiers returning, the Bolsheviks around, and so forth, they literally seized the, the factories, making the weapons and the shirts, the radios, they seized it. This is ours. And the managers and the owners had run away. Or, in fact, some managers worked along with the workers and said, let's take over this factory. It's ours! The factory is ours. In Marxian terms, in your second exam, what does that mean? The, work, the, the factories are still operating, they're still producing shirts and shoes and weapons. Who's getting the profits? Yeah. Communist class process. So, a communist class process started to emerge in these industrial enterprises that had been growing so rapidly in the cities, and the workers called them, you really not, Soviets. Soviet. They called them Soviets, and that's where the word comes from, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The Union of Soviet Socialist Soviets. They were called Soviets. They were collectivities in which it looked like the workers not only were producing but appropriating their own surplus, and they produced and appropriated, because someone asked me after the lecture, collectively, not individually, collectively. Last point, and I'm going to let you go. Okay? When the war communist, when, when the war broke out, raised against the whites, Lenin and, and the Stalin and uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Trotsky had a problem on their hands, which is, which is they had to get resources to fight that war. They needed resources to produce weapons to fight the war, and industry was too small. So the first thing, one of the first things that Lenin did was to get rid of the Soviets. If it was a communist fundamental class process, the state stopped the workers from appropriating the surplus and replaced the workers with state officials. 
across this vast land. And the Soviets never were reestablished thereafter. Rather, the prophets now went into the hands of no more than a thousand state officials. And then those state officials got the prophets, and they quickly transferred the prophets to build weapons with the feet of white arm. I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.